And out front now, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Harry Sandick, and former federal prosecutor, Laura Coates. Thanks to both. Harry, you're here. Let me start with you. Donald Jr. says he didn't tell his father about the Trump Tower meeting. Right. Okay? He's been adamant about that. Three days before the meeting, this is June 6th, mm -hmm. he gets off a phone call. That phone call is about the meeting, mm -hmm. right? This is when the meeting is. We've got yep. dirt on Hillary Clinton. Great, bring it on. I want to hear what you've got, right? This is where we are at that I moment. Then, after this phone call, in which he talks about the meeting, he makes a second phone call immediately. It's 11 minutes, and it's to a blocked number. Mm -hmm. He says he doesn't remember who that call was with. Um, we know Trump's residence has a blocked number. How important could this call be? I think it could be very important to demonstrate, if it was, in fact, to the president, uh, whether he knew about this meeting and the subject matter of it. It's a little bit of pretend play that we keep calling it a blocked number, because if the Mueller investigation wants to find out who that is, they can get a subpoena to the phone company. It wasn't blocked from the phone company. The phone company put the call through. So this is knowable, and it may already be known by the Mueller team. Which is significant, Laura, that what Harry's saying, that this is knowable. Absolutely, because remember, we are in a little bit of a reactive mode, trying to uncover what it is the Mueller team already knows, and this jigsaw puzzle piecing together that we have from the transcripts and allowing us to get a clearer picture. But what you're seeing here really is not what we do not know or what we can't discover. What you're seeing is that you're getting the clear picture of why things were done. We know what Donald Trump Jr. anticipated. We know what happened as a result. Mm -hmm. We're getting a clearer version of what his motivation would be. The last question we have to fill in here is who else knew about it. And even if Donald Trump was not directly told, remember, you've got Paul Manafort, the chairman of his campaign, in the room. You've got Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, and his own son in the room. Right. It's almost implausible to suggest that this would not be that the president of the United States would have known something about. Right, which is, you know, the point Laura makes. I mean, Harry, it does yep. seem implausible. And it also seems implausible if, if he gets off a phone call about the upcoming meeting, and right. then we know that that's what it's about. And immediately after, makes an 11-minute call to a block number, and he's saying, oh, I, oh gosh, I... I don't recall that one. That also seems like too much to swallow. Yeah, there was a lot of, if you look through the transcript, there were a lot of, I don't recall what happened. And, you know, look, if you really don't recall, that's an honest answer. But if you say, I don't recall, and you do recall, that's a false statement to Congress. So you're not allowed to do that, obviously. And, and Laura, there's also, you know, as we know, been so much discussion, right, about the misleading statement, right, that came after uh, the trip from Air Force One and the president's involvement in it, right? There was a statement about the meeting, mm -hmm. uh, which was misleading. And uh, President Trump himself, you know, involved with that, apparently. Trump Jr. said his father, quote, we are learning here in the transcript, quote, may have commented through Hope Hicks, who was then uh, also on Air Force One and involved in crafting that statement. What do you make of that? And Don Jr., Laura, saying, I didn't ask for his help, but, but he may have been involved. This is such a sloppy job of trying to have plausible deniability that is completely laughable, Aaron. The idea that, well, he may have been told by the person who is his right-hand woman, who is a direct contact and in charge of this sort of thing, he may have talked to her, and if I can give you one person removed, perhaps then we can all have plausible deniability. It's not how it works. It all says work. There was a convoluted attempt by Donald Trump Jr. to say comments like, well, counsel may have been involved. Remember, there was a lot of backlash at the time of his testimony that he was trying to to assert an attorney-client privilege in a laughable way that right. did not apply to circumstances here. So right. yet again, you have Donald Trump Jr. floundering, almost contorting himself, trying to hedge in a way that's only going to raise suspicion. And, and Harry, before we go, Bob yeah. Mueller today, we're learning, had another subpoena, mm -hmm. uh, the former social media advisor to Roger Stone. His name's Jason yeah. Sullivan. But Roger Stone, obviously, of Guccifer 2.0 right. and, and, and close advisor to the president. Roger Stone, not yet, uh, <laughs> such that we know. Uh, has not been questioned by Mueller. But, but he, getting to his social media advisor, significant? I think it is significant. We know that he had this tweet about Podesta being in the barrel soon that came just before Podesta's emails were released. Um, right. This is the kind of thing you would do if you want to show <laughs> that that tweet actually came from Stone and not from some other person off to the side who's just kind of managing an account. So you want someone okay. who can say, Stone has his phone, he puts his tweets on. If that was on his Twitter account, it's because it's something he said. And then you can use that as evidence against Stone. If it was done by someone else who wasn't working for Stone, you couldn't necessarily use it against Stone. It would be All much right. harder. All right. Thank you both.